much for having me. I've been reading The Rumpus since the day that it launched, so Woo! it is thrilling to be here. And I just want to say that I've been reading all over the country for the past year, because this just came out in paperback. And um, this is the only reading in which the phrase wired pussy has been uttered. So I think that automatically makes this the best reading I've ever done before I've actually even opened this book or heard anything else anyone else has to say. Um, okay. So, A Fortunate Age, in short, is a long, um, sort of Victorian-ish, to make it sort of really exciting, Victorian-style novel um, about a group of Oberlin grads who moved to New York in the late 90s during the tech boom, um, a phenomenon that I'm sure you're familiar with, living in San Francisco, and um, try to make their way in for lack of a better term, bohemian fields, um, only to find themselves crushed by the economic, economic forces at play in the city. Um, it takes place over about six years, and um, they end up living rather more um, conventional lives than they expected to. That is not a spoiler. Um, <laughs> so, I am going to read um, a very brief section about a character named Dave Cohen, and um, all you need to know about him, it, this is part of the way through the novel, but you don't really need to know anything other than the fact that he's um, what would have been called in the early 90s um, a slacker, if anyone remembers that term. Um, I've been trying to revive it, but it hasn't really worked, but um, you can help me if you want. Um, and um, he, when you meet him at, at this point in the novel, he has inherited um, a nice chunk of change from his grandmother, and um, his dad um, suggested that he use this money to make some kind of large purchase because he basically knew that Dave, you know, was the kind of person who would take the money and spend it on like crack and whores and, and then it would all be gone. So he was like, buy something that you will have forever. And Dave somehow managed to figure out how to purchase um, a piece of property. And now um, is figuring out that when you put a down payment on something, you then have this thing called a mortgage that you have to actually pay every month. So he does actually have to earn money so um, that's about where we meet him. The only other things you need to know about him are that um, he has a, a close friend named Tal, who's mentioned, and another close friend named Sadie, who's mentioned. Okay, here you go. Dave had been back in New York for 10 months now, cobbling together his mortgage payments from teaching piano, which he hated, accompanying, which he hated even more, cupping scores for composers, which he vacillated between hating and loving, and various sorts of menial labor, like temping or waiting tables, which, strangely, he loved. The trouble was that while he had very strong feelings about what he didn't want to do, he possessed only an extremely vague idea of what he did want to do, this being that he would like to work on music that people actually listened to, rather than classical music, which really no one cared about anymore. Okay, wait, I just have to stop myself so that I left out the most pertinent piece of information, which is that he's a pianist. So, <laughs> Now it all makes sense. Okay, um, and went to Juilliard as a, as a kid, um, and Ed Oberlin studied piano. You know, Oberlin has a conservatory. He studied piano there, and he's just, as you'll see, dropped out of grad school for piano, and come back to New York, having no idea what what to do with his life, basically. Okay, um, sounds like many people, including me. Okay. Um, <laughs> Okay, this, he possessed only an extremely big idea of what he did want to do. This being that he would like to work on music that people actually listen to rather than classical music, which really no one cared about anymore, or only the people who played it and wrote it and taught it. Normal people simply weren't interested. Maybe they listened to the Brandenburg Concertos or Appalachian Spring, or kept WNYC on as background music, or attended a concert once a year so they could feel cultured, but that was it. This was exactly why he'd given up piano, or this was what he'd told himself when he decided to drop out of Eastman, that he didn't want to be part of the absurd, archaic institution that classical music had become. He wanted to make real music, music that possessed some sort of relevance to the dominant culture, music that meant something. But the truth was that over four unhappy years of grad school, he'd come to the sad realization that he was not a genius or a prodigy, as he'd been told throughout his life. 
and that he would not have a career as a soloist, but would be lucky to get a, a seat with a second or third tier orchestra in a provincial city, or a teaching post at a Bible college, also in some unappealing place like Kansas or Missouri, teaching talentless undergrads. Both possibilities fell into the don't want to do category. In theory, he wanted, he thought, to compose music, to do something really revolutionary, something that would garner the respect of critics and a popular audience, something that would transcend current notions of genre. Lying in his bed, mornings on Bourbon Street, thinking he should really get up and write down the snippet of melody drifting in and out of his brain, he comforted himself with the thought that he was destined for higher sorts of things than pop songs, that he was destined for this hybrid music he imagined, this relevant classical music, but there wasn't really any such thing. He would have to invent it. Otherwise, what were his non-pop options? Scoring films, romantic swell as the spaceship hurdles into the dark heart of the unknown galaxy. Drafting minimalist pieces that called for the players to bang on sheets of metal or pluck violin strings with their teeth. Or shuffling together neo-romantic motifs from the pantheon of canonical symphonies like all the bright-eyed composers at Oberlin with their tweed jackets and college scarves. He hated them all. What would they do anyway? Get PhDs at Berkeley or Stanford? The money was all that West for reasons he didn't understand. It wasn't like people on the far coast listened to classical music any more than people in New York or Boston. Yes, they would get PhDs and live off grants and sad little commissions from Bang on a Can or Kronos. Yes, that's exactly what they do. Then settle into dull teaching gigs and fuck the cute violinists. A life of perpetual irrelevance, like a character in a Philip Roth novel or a Woody Allen movie. Or Herzog, fucking Herzog. No way, no fucking way. The irony was, of course, that in college, not to mention in the many years that preceded college, while his friends flailed about taking classes in performance art or the history of Christian utopian movements, wondering exactly what they wanted to do with their lives, his future had essentially been set. Not worrying about career and so on had freed up a lot of his time in Oberlin, allowing him ample hours to fret over other things like girls or existential matters. During the three years he lived with Tal, first in Keep, then in a shabby house off North Professor Street, Tal had patiently listened to Dave ramble on about such things while they ate cold fried chicken from convenient food mart and sipped cans of Pabst Blue Ribbon. Now, with the clear vision provided by hindsight, Dave saw that Tal might have found Dave annoying or whiny or, as Sadie would say, a bit tiresome. And maybe this was why Dave rarely heard from Tal anymore. In those days, Tal had a lot more to complain about than did Dave. Tal's parents were Boston conservatives who scrutinized Tal's grades each semester and expected him to go to law school like a good Brookline boy. Never mind that Tal had no interest in law or medicine or business or the other professions deemed acceptable by his dad. Had, in fact, never expressed interest in doing anything other than acting. And more to the point was not some stupid, deluded sucker like half, no, more than half, the losers in the theater department but seriously, hugely, freakishly talented and in possession of that certain something that makes people, if not stars, then at least compulsively watchable. Everyone thought so, everyone. One of his professors had encouraged him to apply to Yale. Another had suggested he leave school and simply find an agent. Tell your parents Peter Carson thinks you can get into Yale, Sadie had encouraged Tal. My parents, Tal told her, don't care about Peter Carson or what he thinks. They were so reluctant to encourage his acting that his senior year at Concord, they'd refused to attend any and every play in which he was cast, from Midsummer to Six Characters in Search of an Author, to the play that Tal himself wrote, which would have been enough to make Dave fucking burn their house down. But not Tal, he loved them, the Morgenthals. They're great, really. And he couldn't stand the thought of disappointing them, even in the smallest way, which just made no sense to Dave. Poor Tal, Dave had thought again and again in college, watching his friend take these deadly poli-sci classes to pacify his hard-ass father, who was under the impression that his only son, his only child, would be Harvard Law, class of 97. Not that Tal did anything to disabuse him of this notion. He's wearing himself out, Dave told Sadie early in their senior year. It's moronic. He rehearses until, like, midnight. Then he hangs out with me, and when I go to bed, he, like, studies. Dave. There's a difference between wearing yourself out and working, retorted Sadie. We all can't live Dave Cohane's life of leisure. But Sadie, for once, didn't get it. The town might give it all up, give everything up, might become this waste of life, this suburban nothing, 
that he might become one of those people who do the right thing, the expected thing, that he might go to fucking law school and get married and live in fucking Newton and listen to public radio in his Volvo. <laughs> and Dave would be left alone, alone with himself. Thank you guys. Thank you so much for having me.